so let's begin. Yeah, my name is Andy Smith. I've been working as a change agent since uh, 1993, initially in the UK and more recently in the Middle East and Southeast Asia as well. I've been studying emotional intelligence for the last 15 years and I'm particularly interested in two areas. One is how the beliefs and assumptions that leaders bring to their work affect their performance. And secondly, how teams can be more productive and effective through harnessing their innate emotional intelligence. So uh, what we're going to cover in the webinar today is really five, five main points, which are, whoops, there we go. Um, first of all, what is emotional intelligence? Secondly, how emotions affect your, your team's thinking skills and, of course, your thinking skills as well. Thirdly, understanding the effect that you have on the emotional climate of your team, and I'll explain this term, emotional climate, uh, when we get into the webinar. Um, fourthly, four ways that you can employ to become a more emotionally intelligent leader. And finally, a simple model for applying emotional intelligence to any issue, problem, or decision that you face. So we have about half an hour for the presentation and there'll also be some time at the end of the webinar if you have a specific question or situation in mind. Um, some of you have already sent in some questions which uh, I'll address at the end of the webinar. So first of all, what is emotional intelligence? Let's contrast emotional intelligence, first of all, with the traditional narrower view of intelligence, which focused on what's known as intelligence quotient, or IQ. IQ measures two kinds of intelligence, uh, what's known as logical or mathematical intelligence, which is about pattern detection, drawing logical conclusions, and being good with numbers, and linguistic intelligence, which is being good with language. These are the skills that the education system, certainly in the Western world, has traditionally selected for. And in fact, a high IQ score is a good predictor of academic success and good grades at school and university. But it's not such a good predictor of success, however you want to measure success in life or in work. Have you ever worked with somebody who's intellectually very bright, but uh, they may be insecure or they belittle the people that work for them or their general mood is irritable? Um, someone who might be a high performer in themselves, but who's a drag on the performance of their team and their colleagues because other people can't stand working with them. So if you have ever worked with somebody like that, you'll understand that clearly IQ is not all that's needed for working successfully. If we define intelligence very broadly as the ability to learn and to solve problems, some other competencies are also needed. So what are these other forms of intelligence? You may already be familiar with Howard Gardner's idea of multiple intelligences. Howard Gardner is a deve developmental psychologist who challenged the view that intelligence is a single entity. Instead, he argues that there are multiple intelligences which develop relatively independently of each other. So as well as um, the linguistic and the logical mathematical intelligences that we, uh, we've already dealt with, these include visual and spatial intelligence uh, such as an artist or an architect might have. Uh, bodily and kinesthetic intelligence, which sports people and dancers have, is about being aware of where your body is in relation to others at any given moment and being able to solve problems with it. So the Manchester United footballer Wayne Rooney, for example, is probably not going to have a high-flying academic career when he retires from football, but there are few people better at solving problems in the fast-moving environment of the football pitch. Musical intelligence is fairly self-explanatory, but the two that really concern us here are interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence is about understanding and being able to relate to and influence other people. Intrapersonal intelligence is about being aware of, making sense of, and managing your own emotions. So these last two intelligences make up what uh, has been called EQ, which stands for emotional quotient, or emotional intelligence.
If we have to define emotional intelligence, this is about the most concise definition that I'm aware of. It's by Daniel Goleman, who published the best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, in 1996. Um, before that, emotional intelligence had been a fairly obscure term in academic psychology, worked on by researchers like John Mayer and Peter Salovey and Reuven Baron. So why did the concept of emotional intelligence, which was previously just an academic thing, strike such a chord with the business world? Well, the business relevance of emotional intelligence comes from this simple question. How much of themselves do people bring to work? In many workplaces, people check their passion, their creativity, and their humor at the door every day when they show up. So they're, they're operating on maybe 10 or 20% of their capacity. But the heart is at least as important as the head when it comes to motivating people and connecting with customers. The businesses which succeed in the 21st century will be the ones which harness discretionary effort, which is the stuff that people do at work beyond what they have to do, beyond what's in the, uh, the letter of their employment contract and their job description which harness discretionary effort by making it possible for people to bring the whole of their intelligence, emotional as well as intellectual, to work with them. So emotional intelligence then is the capacity for recognizing our own feelings and recognizing feelings in other people, and also for managing emotions effectively in others and in ourselves. Let's have a look at the components of this definition. So you'll see that uh, there's two components which it identifies. Um, one is being awareness, being aware of emotions, and the other one is management, being able to manage those emotions. And each of those can be applied to emotions in yourself and also to being aware of and managing emotions in other people. So we, that gives us this nice uh, quadrant structure which, with four parts or four competencies to emotional intelligence. Self-awareness in the top left is being aware of your own emotions and understanding what gives rise to those emotions. Self-management is being able to manage your own emotions and hence the actions that spring from them effectively. Social awareness is recognizing and understanding emotions in other people. And relationship management is being able to manage and inspire emotions in others. Each of these is highly relevant to leadership, but self-awareness is the key, the cornerstone on which the others rest. If you're not aware of your own emotions, you won't be able to manage them because they'll constantly be taking you by surprise. And social awareness will be difficult because the way we recognize emotions in other people involves partially reproducing them within ourselves, as we'll see. And if you don't have that social awareness and you're sometimes hijacked by your own emotions if your self-management is poor, that will make relationship management very difficult. So you won't be able to handle and inspire emotions in other people. Now let's Let's look at three ways in which emotions affect your cognitive capacities, your ability to think and take decisions. First of all, this idea that strong emotions make us stupid. Strong emotional arousal knocks out the brain's prefrontal cortex, which is the pink part on the picture there, which is, as far as we can tell, the part responsible for what's called executive function, which is decision-making, planning, impulse control, especially in social situations, and deciding what's good or bad. So with strong emotions, that part is knocked out altogether. It doesn't matter how intellectually intelligent and rational we normally are. If our emotions get too strong, we stop thinking, and we act on instinct and impulse which can sometimes get us into real trouble or even derail our careers completely. Think about when uh, a few years back when Mike Tyson got annoyed in a boxing match and bit off part of Evander Holyfield's ear, or Zinedine Zidane headbutting Marco Materazzi in the 2006 World Cup final, or perhaps closer to home when perfectly pleasant and intelligent people are out driving and they get road rage. 
they turn into snarling animals and they can endanger themselves and other drivers. So being able to control strong emotion and just as importantly to recognize the signs of strong emotion building up so you control it, you can control it before it takes you over are absolutely vital. Secondly, emotions affect decision making for two reasons. Emotions carry information about our own values and desires, what's important to us. The more important something is to us, the stronger we feel about it. They can also carry information about how other people are likely to respond, because other people's emotions resonate within us. So we've already seen how uh, having too much emotion can knock out your decision-making capacities. Too little emotion is as ruinous to decision making as too much emotion. This is neatly illustrated in a case study by the neurologist Antonio Damasio in his book Descartes' Error. One of his patients, who he calls Elliot, was a high-flying corporate lawyer. Elliot developed a brain tumor which was successfully removed. As a result of the operation, his intellect was unimpaired and all the usual tests of brain function showed up as normal. But there was one problem. He couldn't function at work anymore. He would take, for example, all day to read just one letter. He'd get completely engrossed in it and lose himself. As a result, he soon lost his home, his job, and his marriage. Damasio discovered that brain surgery had uh, damaged the part of his brain that integrates emotion with reason. Intellectually, Elliot could see the consequences of different options but he no longer had the feelings which told him that one option would be better than another. When Damasio offered him a choice of two appointment times, he would take hours to consider the pros and cons of each time until Damasio had to step in and make the decision for him. We need emotions to make our decisions because without emotions, nothing matters to us. The third way in which emotions affect our thinking skills is this. Even if you moderate your emotions to the point where the thinking part of your brain is still functioning well, your emotional state affects how well your thinking works. Research by psychologists such as Alice Eisen and Barbara Fredrickson show that the positive emotional states help you take on new information more quickly so you can make faster decisions. And they also help you see the big picture more easily so you can make better decisions and can also think more creatively and strategically. Positive emotional states also make you more resilient so you can recover from setbacks more quickly. Your emotional state also affects judgment, expectations of success and social interactions. So when a new team comes together, it will meld into an effective unit more quickly when the overall mood, the emotional climate of the team how it feels to work there is positive and optimistic. Let's talk a bit about the emotional climate. Um, as we've already mentioned, a positive emotional climate, how it feels to work in that team. If that's positive, if people feel good working there, if they feel engaged working there, it helps each individual team member to think more creatively, think more strategically, and make faster decisions. A positive emotional climate makes it easier to hold on to talent. Generally, people don't leave their company, they leave their immediate boss. So a positive emotional climate will make them more likely to want to stay and reduce turnover. The effect of a positive emotional climate, um, Daniel Goleman from his studies estimates that uh, it's responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of performance, but the effect goes beyond the bottom line, beyond finances. In some cases, the emotional climate can be a matter of life or death. Uh, there's one study of um, cardiac care units that I'm aware of where the worst performing unit in the study, where the nurse's mood was described as depressed, and I think hostile as well, had four times the patient mortality rate of comparable units. So if you had heart problems, that's not the unit you'd want to be taken to. Let's have a look now at how you can influence the emotional climate of your team for the better.
Emotions are contagious. We influence the emotions of people around us and we are influenced by their emotions in turn. It's been discovered fairly recently that we use the same regions of the brain for expressing emotion through facial expression, for example, and for detecting emotions in others. So these two abilities are closely linked. For example, when somebody smiles at you, the part of your brain that's responsible for controlling the facial muscles involved in smiling, the premotor cortex, lights up. So smiles are contagious. Fortunately, laughter and smiling are the most contagious emotion and they're more likely to spread further between people than, for example, irritation. And very fortunately, depression is about the least contagious emotion. So, if emotions within the team are contagious, how can you make sure that the emotional climate of your team remains positive? If you're leading a team, the person in that team with the most influence over the emotions of that team is you. You have more influence over, over how your team feels than you realize. Leaders consistently underestimate the influence that they have on the emotions of their team. When things are going along as normal, team members know what the range of expected emotional responses are. In times of crisis or uncertainty, in situations they've never faced before, they're not so sure how they should be behaving and how they should be responding. So they're going to look to their leader, you, for cues as to how to behave in that unfamiliar situation. You, more than any other team member, set the emotional tone for your team, if you're leading that team. So if you remain strong and positive in a crisis or in an uncertain situation, that will have a positive effect on your team. Generally, up to a certain limit, which will partly be culturally determined, the more emotionally expressive you are, the more influence you have on the emotions of people around you. So in teams where the nominal leader is not very emotionally expressive, a kind of emotional power vacuum can develop. In that situation, another team member who is more emotionally expressive can become the, as it were, emotional leader of the team, the one who has the most influence on the team's emotional climate, even if they don't have high status on paper. The good news from this is that you can still have a strong positive effect on your team's emotional climate, even if you're not the nominal leader of your team. Now let's have a look at four ways in which you can become a more emotionally intelligent leader. So here's our um, four quadrant model of emotional intelligence again. There are things that you can do to develop your strengths in each of these four competency areas, self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management. Let's start with self-awareness since this is the foundation of the other competencies. One thing you can do is keep a journal of how you're feeling each day. I suggest that um, you take maybe just a, a few minutes, uh, probably ideally first thing in the morning before the day has had a chance to hit you with any kind of crises or challenges, and just write down how you're feeling. There are a few benefits to this. One is that writing your emotions down help to get them into perspective. Uh, so you have some distance from them and hence some awareness and some control. Secondly, um, over a period of months, if you look back over the journal um, from a few months ago and you can relate it to what was going on in your life at that time, you can see how what you feel, how you respond, is related to particular events in your life. So you, you gain a greater self-awareness about how you respond to particular situations and what you've learned from them as well. 
another way in which you can increase your self-awareness is to have some coaching, receive some coaching either from an external executive coach or if you have a, co um, a coaching culture within your organization, maybe from a colleague, maybe from your manager. That can be very valuable in uh, having somebody to act as a sounding board in uh, gaining more idea about how you feel about particular issues and also of course the other benefits of coaching in terms of coming up with new ideas for problem solving and so on. One further way you can increase your emotional self-awareness is to ask for feedback, ideally from people that you trust uh, so that you know it's honest feedback. And bear in mind, of course, the more respect they hold you in, um, possibly they may even hold you in a certain amount of awe. So uh, there may be an element initially of them telling you what they think you want to hear. So emphasize that you want honest feedback. Giving some attention to your emotional self-awareness will also enable you to notice the signs of if you're getting into a, a negative or unproductive emotional state. If you, if you notice those signs, you can head it off before it gets too strong and hijacks your thinking capacities. Let's have a look now at some ways of managing your emotions and making sure that they don't get so strong that they hijack you. first item on the list there, the pause, is a very useful tool in emotional self-management. If you notice the signs within yourself that you're getting angry or irritated, you can stop what you're doing, take some calm breaths, and change your posture. This will interrupt the pattern of emotional escalation and give your body and your thoughts a chance to calm down. Similarly, it's worth pausing for a moment at the end of one task before you start in on the next task so that you're not carrying stresses over from one task to another. Following on from that, it's a good idea at work to take a break every 90 minutes or so. The reason being that we have a, a natural cycle of activity and rest. Um, in the wild, in nature as it were, we would be active for about 90 minutes and then we'd have a little rest for about 20 minutes or so and, that, and then we'd be active again. And that cycle goes on through the waking part of the day. It tends to shorten a little bit towards the end of the evening or the afternoon so we might be active for about 60 minutes before we feel like we need a break. Of course, we're not robots. We don't automatically shut down at the end of every 90 minutes. It's perfectly possible, and I've observed this time and time again in, um, in the UK with clients that I've worked with, it's perfectly possible to work all the way through the morning without taking a break. It's perfectly possible to grab some lunch at your desk and, and work through lunch, work all the way through the afternoon, take work home, work at weekends, and so on. People do that because they think they're getting more done or they feel guilty if they take a break. Actually because they're working in a way that is not friendly to their, uh, to their brain, to the way they're made, they're actually being less productive. What happens in um, the rest activity cycle is this. At any given time, um, our brain has two hemispheres, of course, left and right hemisphere. At any given time, there's more activity going on in one hemisphere or the other. So one hemisphere or the other is dominant. Most of the time, for most of us, in work mode, it's the left side of the brain, the left hemisphere, that's dominant. When we take a break, when we have a rest, activity moves over to the right side of the brain, so that becomes dominant for a short while until it's time to go back to work again, and the left side is dominant. The left side is responsible for things like thinking, analysis, words, maths, um, reason, logic, calculation, analysis, those kind of functions, which for most of us is work mode most of the time, unless we're some kind of uh, maybe creative artist or something like that. The left side of the brain 
is more creative, more dreamy, it tends not to think in uh, words, it's not very good with maths, it tends to think in feelings and symbols and images, and it works by association rather than logic. If we work solidly for several hours and we don't take a break, uh, eventually the left side of the brain gets very tired. I don't know if you found yourself in the situation at the end of a day where you maybe read a, um, a page of a report, the executive summary of a report, and you read it three or four times and you've still got no idea what it's saying. Or you add up a column of figures and a one column of figures and you get a different answer every time. That's a sign that the side of your brain that you've been using for work mode has got tired. And in that situation, eventually, it will hand over the work to the other side of the brain, which is really not equipped to process words, certainly not equipped to process mathematical calculations, which is why um, eventually you end up just wanting to stare out of the window. So when you take a break, the left side of your brain can relax. It can have a rest. And when you come back to work, in, it doesn't have to be 15 minutes, could be 10, could be 5, it's refreshed. So again, you get more done in less time, you make fewer mistakes. Um, I used at one time to do a lot of uh, stress management advice for individuals. Uh, often they were uh, um, referred to me by their doctor. And a lot of these were very high achieving, hard working individuals and they used to say things like, well, this is great in theory, Andy, but um, I would have to take all of those 15 minute uh, breaks and add them on to the end of my working day in order to get the work finished. So I'd end up spending even longer at work than uh, previously. Well, actually, no. We're not machines. We don't work at a constant rate. Uh, sometimes you accomplish a huge amount in a short time. Other times it can feel really hard work to get anything done. When you take breaks, you can get more done in less time. You're working more effectively. And of course, you give permission, by, by doing it yourself, you give permission for your team to take breaks and work more effectively as well. So don't believe, um, don't take my word for it. Try it out in your own work and see what happens. Finally, as we've, uh, as we've mentioned, if you ensure that your overall mood is positive, and uh, to do this it helps to focus on what's working in your life and in your work, what's been achieved and what you appreciate in your situation, you'll be more resilient in the face of setbacks. I should mention that in the face-to-face -face workshop that uh, I'm going to conduct at the, uh, the Palm 5 event in May, we'll learn some more practical ways of being centered and in control of your emotions, which uh, aren't really possible to do via webinar. You need to actually be there in the room um, so that you can stay calm and resourceful in any situation. Now, let's look at some ways of enhancing your awareness and understanding of emotions in others. Pay attention to the body language and voice tone of the of, uh, the other person when you're in a meeting with them, when you're speaking with them, when you're in conversation. Body language and voice tone are the markers which give you clues as to how other people are feeling. Um, the next point is really important. Be fully present. Be 100% there and give the other person, or if you're speaking to a group, your audience, 100% of your attention. Have you ever had a meeting with a superior whose attention is obviously elsewhere? Maybe they're looking at their emails while you're talking. Maybe they're taking phone calls during the meeting. How do you feel in those situations? Rest assured, if you're not giving 100% of your attention to the person you're with, they will feel like that too. Even if you've just come out of a difficult meeting that's given you a lot to think about, and even if the next thing in your diary is another meeting that you're apprehensive about, you need to be 100% present for that person in front of you. You can't fake paying attention. If you're not 100% present, the other person will notice. Um, make sure that your own body language is open and responsive so that you're conveying a message that you're ready to listen to the other person and that you want to hear what they've got to say. One of the main motivators for most people in the work situation is that they feel valued and listened to. 
Also, put yourself in the shoes of the other person or people that you're speaking to. Imagine how they want to be treated and how you can deliver your message in a way that they will be most receptive to. Um, imagine how your decisions will affect them and their likely emotional responses. Again, it's not quite as simple as thinking, how would I want to be treated in this situation? Because people have different personalities. If you know your audience, if you know the other person that you're speaking to, the other people that are affected by your decisions, you can get some ideas of how they're likely to respond. So take a moment to put yourself in their shoes. Imagine that you're them. How are you going to feel hearing this message or being on the receiving end of this decision? Finally, some ways that you can enhance your relationship management skills. I'd encourage you to look at your relationship with each employee or in your team or each colleague as being like an emotional bank account. Sometimes if you need them to put in some extra effort to meet a deadline or to deal with a crisis, you're going to want to make a withdrawal from that bank account, which is only going to work if you've put something into the account previously. So here are some ways that you can build up your emotional bank account with your team members. Recognize and support them as individuals. People want to feel valued, and some people need more feedback and encouragement than others. Uh, again, we go into how you can find out how much feedback they need in to overcome challenges. It's not enough to have a vision as a leader. You have to infuse people with it. Find out the values that motivate your people and show them ways in which the vision fulfills those values. If the vision is linked to their values, they will feel motivated to make it happen. They'll identify with it. And last, be a consistent role model. If there's a clash between what you're saying and what you're doing, people will believe what you're doing. So walk your talk. And finally, let's have a look at a simple format for bringing your emotional intelligence to bear on any problem or decision that you face. So here's the emotional intelligence quadrant again. Almost any issue problem or challenge is going to involve other people and their emotions. And of course, your emotional state affects your chances of success. Um, situations could be making a sale to an important customer, uh, deciding between two opportunities that conflict, introducing significant changes to your team, dealing with difficult people, uh, resolving conflict between team members, Almost any problem that arises at work, uh, there are going to be other people and emotions involved. So you're more likely to succeed whatever the issue if you pay attention to the emotions involved, where you want those emotions to be, and how to get them there. So going back to our four quadrant model, we consider the situation from the perspective of each quadrant in turn. It's always best to start with yourself and start with self-awareness. So the questions you'd ask facing any challenge are, what am I feeling about this? And where did those feelings come from? How did those feelings arise? And because feelings, emotions carry information, what information are these feelings carrying? Or you might ask, uh, what is this feeling trying to tell me? From there, uh, depending on how strongly you feel about the situation, uh, you might want to go to social awareness after that, or you might want to go to self-management first. So if it's a situation that you feel angry or anxious about to the point where it's getting in the way of your thinking skills and your cognitive capacities, uh, you might want to go straight to self-management from there. So ask yourself, what do you want to feel? Uh, what do you need to do? 
in order to feel that way. Because there are some um, emotional states that are more conducive to solving problems than others. So if it's a really difficult problem, determined to resolve it would be a better state than angry or anxious, for example. What do you need to do in order to feel that way? Um, maybe you need to get some additional information, maybe you need to change your work patterns slightly, maybe you need to get advice from other people. You won't know until you ask yourself that question, what's uh, the best thing to do to manage your emotional state before you actually try and tackle the problem. Moving to the social awareness quadrant, consider the other people involved in this issue, in this situation. Um, so, for example, if it's a job interview, um, put yourself in the shoes of the people on the interview panel. Um, if you're giving a presentation, put yourself in the shoes of the audience. If you're making a sale, put yourself in the shoes of the customer. And ask yourself, what is the other person feeling? And where did those feelings come from? How did those feelings arise? If you have different stakeholders in the issue, uh, you may want to do it um, separately for each separate person involved. If it's people you've not met before uh, and they're in a group like an interview panel or um, an audience for a presentation, you can treat them as a collective. So what are those piece of people feeling? How did those feelings arise? So when you've got to that stage, um, ideally you know what you're feeling about it, you understand the message that any message that those feelings are trying to give you. Uh, you have an idea of how you want to feel in that situation and you have an idea of what you need to do in order to feel that way. You also have some awareness or some guess anyway, uh, which you'll have to confirm by observing what they actually say and do of how the other people involved are feeling and perhaps where those feelings came from so that you can make sense of them. So finally, in the relationship management quadrant, you ask, how do we want, how do I want these other people to feel? And of course, you can't make other people feel the way that you want. Uh, life would be very easy for you if you could. What you can do, though, is uh, do your very best to behave and create this, the conditions in which it's possible or easier for them to feel that way. So the next question there is, what do you need to do in order for these other people to feel the way that you want them to feel? I'm not saying that applying these questions to every issue or every problem or every decision will automatically give you an answer easily. What it will do is increase your awareness give you some ideas as to how other people are likely to react and probably give you some ideas about what you need to do in order to make that situation better or to gather the information that you need for the next step. So it's, uh, it's a model that you can use straight away in any situation that's, uh, that's a challenge or a problem. Okay. So that is um, the content of the webinar. I've actually got no idea at all at the moment um, how we're doing for time here, but uh, I'm sure Ali, who is uh, organizing, organizing this for Mile, will have an idea. Um, um, so Yes, we're doing good. Um, Ali, we, um, uh, we, we have taken about 40 minutes. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So are we open for the Okay, so we have 20 minutes for uh, any questions you may have. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you very much, Andy. Um, uh, folks, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, there's a hand icon on your webinar console, so if you click on it, I'll be able to give you an opportunity to speak to Andy. Uh, or equally, you could put your questions in the chat box, question box. Uh, I'll be happy to read them over on your behalf. Uh, I see there are already a few hands. Um, been raised, so let me go. Um, okay. And kindly please be uh, precise, brief uh, uh, with your question, and do introduce yourself. So let me go ahead first. Uh, Mr. Uh, Brother Tariq Salim, uh, can you hear us? Could you please introduce yourself and ask the question? 
Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Hello? Yes, I do. Yeah, great. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Tarek Salim. I'm a uh, faculty of economics at the American University of in Cairo. And um, um, it's been uh, a very um, um, interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I have a I have uh, I have put some questions. If Ali would like to uh, uh, mention uh. them after my uh, my current question, um, the um, the quadrant seem to have a, f a fixed uh, a kind of uh, self versus social in terms of awareness and uh, and management. Uh, how do you think this kind of distinction can be uh, blurred? A little bit in in, in some uh, social centric societies like in the Middle East, where um, actually self awareness and self um, uh, motivation uh, could be actually a function of social awareness and social motivation. In a sense that, that um, there there has to be some kind of a social consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, acting in certain direction, how does this, how can this relate to what we're you know what we're talking about right now? So, this is a um, a fascinating question. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I should just say actually that um, I'm connected to the internet via satellite link, so there's a little bit of a what they call a latency delay while uh, what I'm saying goes up to the satellite and comes back down again. And, and of course the other way with the uh, signals coming back so do excuse me if there's a, a little bit of a delay here um, yeah so okay. yes this model originates in the West which um, as we know is is a more kind of individualistic society than some others uh, around the world where perhaps um, there's more emphasis on the individual and less on uh, the family and the wider community um, I would say that the distinction between self and other is still meaningful, um, but you could, for example, apply the, um, the questions in the quadrant on that last slide that's still on the screen. Um, you could, for example, make the left-hand side of it, what are we feeling and um, how do we want um, other stakeholders to feel. Uh, Beyond that, um, values and motivations may originate uh, more with um, social groups, with society, with family, rather than necessarily just coming from within the individual, but um, they're still, they are still there in the individual and the individual can, the, the emotional reactions that happen within the individual. So I think it is still uh, very relevant. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, that's about all I can say, but it's, it's a very deep question. I'd have to think a lot about it, I think, and probably engage in uh, quite a lot more dialogue with, um, with uh, people as well to, uh, to really come up with um, a totally satisfactory answer to that one, because it is a big question. Uh, does that help at all? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, great. Ali, who's up next? Hello? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, sorry. Oh, right. Uh, right. Okay, an interesting okay, one from Brother Salim, a supplementary. Are we born as optimists, pessimists? If yes, how do we change such an intrinsic personal characteristics? Oof. Um, are we born as? I am not sure. I think uh, I'm, I'm not up with the latest academic psychology for this particular question. I believe there is a... There's a genetic component, but there's also an upbringing and social component to whether we're optimists or pessimists. Uh, and I believe it is possible to change at least a bit from one to the other. Uh, of course, in certain situations, it's useful to be pessimistic. So um, if you are in charge of safety at a uh, nuclear reactor, for example, 
um, it's a good idea to be quite pessimistic and, and think about what could go wrong, uh, rather than thinking, oh, it'll probably be okay. Um, that, that's the kind of thinking uh, that probably got them into trouble <laughs> at uh, Chernobyl. So, um, yeah, it's uh, if you look at um, if you look at where you want to get to in the future, if you look at what's working in your life currently, if you look at the, your own strengths and the strengths of your team you will tend to become a little bit more optimistic. It will open up some possibilities. If you look at uh, problems all the time, if you look at uh, what's gone wrong, if you look at your failings and shortcomings, you'd probably become more pessimistic. So it's a question of what's more useful in any given situation. I would say when you're leading people, and particularly when you're setting a vision for the future, uh, and particularly when dealing with complex problems, it's better to be optimistic. So it's better to focus on what's working and build that rather than just looking at what's going wrong and um, how bad everything is, I would say. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let's move to the next person. Um, let me unmute Mr. Imran Yusuf. Could, can you hear us? Could you please introduce yourself and ask the question? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Imran Yusuf. I'm an executive search consultant. People sometimes like to call us executive recruiters uh, based out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, first of all, thank you, Andy, for such an informative session. It, it, has been, it has been excellent uh, in terms of information. Uh, I, got, I got two okay. quick questions, uh, two really okay. quick questions, and both are in regards to assessments. So the first question is, okay. which online uh, assessment would you recommend uh, for uh, for a person to take? That's one. And secondly, second, I know it's a very complicated question, but uh, mm -hmm. how can I, while I am interviewing a C-level executive, how can I assess his emotional intelligence face to face? Um, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Look into your eyes. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, so there are, um, so, so the first one then about um, which online assessments uh, can I take. You, you're looking uh, uh, for yourself or for your candidates or, or what? Uh, initially for myself and then of course for, uh, for a candidate. Right, okay. Um, it's uh, it's very much a horses for courses question, um, bearing in mind that serious emotional intelligence assessments uh, with scientific validity behind them that have, that have uh, been normed and validate, validated and so on, uh, there is a cost associated with, with those and it's usually at least around the $100 mark, probably more now. Um, having said that, uh, the, the most useful one for recruitment is probably the bar on EQI assessment. That's, uh, that's been shown to have some positive correlation to job performance in certain roles. Um, with an executive already in post, uh, the ECI 360, which uh, is the one I'm qualified in, uh, and which works with this four quadrant model uh, is a good one. Of course, that's a 360 degree, so they will be getting uh, feedback from their employees, from their colleagues, from their boss, and so on. Um, Ali, I, 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 I've got a little um, unvalidated emotional intelligence assessment. I, there was some talk of um, Mile putting that up online. I don't know if that's uh, I don't know if that's available in the um, the mile community yet. Um, uh, I think um, uh, maybe it has been compiled, but we have not populated it as yet. Which we'll do it, and then kind of perhaps we'll inform everyone. Okay. Um, yeah. In, in the meantime, you could uh, you could download yeah. the paper copy from um, coachingleaders.co.uk, which is which mm. is my website. But I want to emphasize that's really not a uh, that's really not a validated assessment in any way. It's more of a thought provoker. So I would say for recruitment, the EQI, probably the best one. For executives already in post, where you have um, 
they've been working there for at least six months, so people have some experience of working with them. Um, probably the uh, the ECI 360 assessment, but neither of those are cheap. Uh, so doing them on a on a large scale wouldn't wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be very economical. Um, right, second question. Uh, how can you assess somebody's emotional intelligence in an interview as, uh, as you're talking to them? <laughs> uh, well, first thing is you get a feel for it. Um, one, there are various questions that you can ask, um, various, various things you can arrange depending on what uh, policies you're looking for. So, for example, if, you, if you're looking for how much attention they pay to other people and how much they care about other people, uh, how about this? You can accidentally, on purpose, drop your pen near their feet and if he picks it up for you, um, that would suggest that at least he's paying some kind of attention to other people. If he ignores it, that's also telling you something about that person, um, which you know, depending on the role, may not be um, may may not rule them out. But uh, if you're looking for um, something in the kind of customer service or um, interacting with the press kind of area, you'd want them to be at least paying attention to what other people do. Um, there are questions you can ask, uh, which will tell you how comfortable they are working on their own or how much feedback they need. You could ask them, uh, how do you know when you're doing a good job? And the answers will be somewhere along the spectrum from uh, I get feedback from my customers or from my manager or from my colleagues, uh, all the way along to I just know. So for roles where the person has to think independently and take decisions independently, you're probably going to want more of a kind of internal frame of reference where they, they have a pretty good idea themselves whether they're doing a good job or not. For lower levels and on the front line of customer service, it's quite useful for people to um, be more reliant on feedback because then if the customer has a problem, they have a problem. Um, a good uh, set of questions uh, that you can look at for uh, recruitment is uh, and interviews is the book Words That Change Minds by Shelley Rose Charvet. Words That Change Minds that you, you can you can look that up and uh, it's it's a good book. It's very readable and it gives you 11 or 12 questions that you can ask that show different aspects of the person's personality, many of which are related to emotional intelligence. Uh, you could ask them to tell you about a time at work that gave you trouble, for example, uh, and depending on how they talk about it, you'll get a feel for how they are dealing with other people. I, I, I feel like I've talked about this one quite a lot, so, so um, maybe we should have another question. Uh, <laughs> yes. does, that, does that help? <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much, Imran, uh, for your question. Um, uh, let's move to uh, another one. Uh, there's another hand been raised. Uh, Mara Moss. Uh, hi, could you hear us, please? Mara? Uh, I think um, unable to hear. So let me move to the chat box. Just there. Sure, um, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, there's a question um, from uh, the Sneem, uh, who works in the Pakistan Civil Aviation Authority. Here is a scenario. You face mm -hmm. a situation where you are unable to clearly know the emotional state by apparent body language, or body language is misleading. How can you get to relate to emotions okay. of the person if you don't know what they are? Any solution to get out of this maze? Okay, um, so I'm taking it that either you're not actually physically with the person, so you can't see them uh, and you're not in touch with them over the phone so you can't hear the tone of their voice um, or it could be one of those people that um, really doesn't give very much away they're keeping up what we might call a, a poker face where they're giving very little evidence of their internal emotional state um, I used to work with a guy like this um, who he, he ran a, a small company that uh, my small company was dealing with and um, everyone was scared of having meetings with him because he really didn't give anything away. His, his face was completely expressionless 
and you didn't get all of the uh, nods and grunts and smiles that you normally get in, uh, in ordinary conversation. So uh, what I did, I matched his way of being. So I became fairly expressionless myself and I, you know, answered questions when he asked them and conversed with him, but um, I left out all the emotional stuff. And I think it was a tactic on his part uh, because it made people uncomfortable and that can be useful in certain situations. Um, as I started to match him and I didn't laugh at his jokes and so on, um, he came to respect me more, he would take meetings with me rather than with my boss and so on. So my first step there, if, if it's a person who's not giving much away emotionally, is to match their kind of energy levels, their expressiveness and so on. So if they're not giving much away, um, don't you give much away either. Now, if, uh, is, is it possible to find from the chat box if that's the situation we're talking about or is this more about when you're only communicating with somebody by email or something like that? Uh, well, uh, Tasneem, if you could uh, do a supplementary on this, um, and uh, if you allow me, uh, we can move to the next question as well, because there are a couple of questions in the chat box. So what do you advise, um, sure. uh, Ali? Meanwhile, Tasneem can write a supplementary based on your suggestion. Uh, yeah, well, while we're waiting for the supplementary, let's get, uh, yeah. let's get the next question underway. Okay, um, there was a hand raised again, let me see. Um, Akanke Rashid, uh, could you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Could you please introduce yes, yourself and uh, ask yeah. the question? Sure. My name is Akanke and I'm a communication specialist. I do several things, but they're all in line with communication and leadership. I wanted to talk, ask a question related to the question, what are you feeling? Sometimes it's not an easy question to answer uh, for, for many people and what can you offer in terms of how to classify one's feelings? Because if you're not, if you're misclassifying your feelings then everything else will sort of be off, uh, it'll be skewed a little bit. So talk about the importance of really being able to recognize what your feelings are I mean, like on the extremes, you can recognize anger or extreme happiness, but there are branches of emotions that I think a lot of people are not necessarily aware of, and can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. Um, first of all, you need to create the space and the quietness where you're not distracted uh, in order to be able to have that level of interest, introspection to be able to ask that question, what am I feeling? Because um, very often, uh, and, and this is particularly true in the West, I think, people distract themselves with, uh, with TV or with activity or with alcohol or whatever, so, so that they actually don't have to pay attention to their feelings. So you need um, a quiet place where you're not going to be interrupted. Um, how you classify the emotion is that what label you put on it is maybe not so important as the question, the answer to the question, what is this trying to tell me? So even if you're aware of the feeling purely as a physical sensation of, uh, you know, my, my stomach feels cold or uh, I have a tightness across my shoulders or something like that, um, even without putting an emotional label on it, uh, if you ask the question of yourself, if this was trying to tell me something, what is it trying to tell me? And leave some space for the answer to come. You may not get it straight away. Uh, it may come in the form of a different feeling. It may come in the form of uh, a word or phrase. It may come in the form of uh, an image coming into your mind. So um, asking what information they carry, I think, is, is, the, uh, is the key question here. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ken Kay. Um, a short question in the chat box by Brother Adil. How, how, do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with managers who depends on sarcasm, sarcastic? 
<laughs> okay, um, so this is a, the, I'm guessing, how do you deal with what, working for a manager who uses sarcasm or yeah. one of your managers uh, yeah. using sarcasm that reports to you? Yeah, I think I, I, need, I, 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 I deem it I, somebody, I can also, I can also yeah, I think it's a person who's dealing, uh, whose manager is using sarcasm a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this is really a question about managing your own emotions first, I think, because um, you, can't, you can't make somebody change, uh, particularly if, if that person is in a position of power relative to you. So um, your first uh, responsibility is to be aware of your own feelings about it and to manage your own state about it. You know, if you find yourself getting upset, uh, if a manager uses sarcasm or angry or irritated or anxious or whatever, um, ask yourself what you're feeling, where did these feelings come from? Maybe uh, if you're feeling uh, an emotion which is out of proportion to the, the, um, the real importance of the current situation, maybe it's because it reminds you of something that happened you know, maybe when you were a child or something like that. And if you, if you notice a link like that, very often being aware of it takes the power away from that feeling. Um, ask yourself how you want to feel, how you want to be when that happens, when that manager is sarcastic and what do you need to do in order to feel that way and do whatever it takes in order to behave in that way. And, and by what do you want to feel, I don't mean, um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to hit the manager. Uh, what do you want to feel and what do you want to do that will bring about the best outcome for you? in that situation. Start thinking about that and start thinking about doing it um, so that you're um, starting to perceive yourself as acting on the manager and having some effect on the situation rather than you being the person that's being acted on all the time. Um, another thing you could do is you could use some subtle behavioral reinforcement so there will be times when the manager is more sarcastic and times when the manager is less sarcastic and if you're more, uh, if you work out what the manager actually wants and do more of that when they're behaving in a more decent way so they get better results by treating you decently, eventually without even realizing it, uh, you'll be training them like you train a dog in order uh, to, to, um, to be more polite, to be more reasonable and to actually say what they want rather than um, speaking sarcastically. So I hope that's been some well, help. Well, that's yes. Um, okay. Um, the next question from uh, Brother Imam Bukhari. Uh, it's written nowadays. It is not only emotional intelligence that the leader must have. To countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, to those Muslim populated countries, a leader must have also a spiritual mm -hmm. intelligence. How do you see these trends? Uh, uh, Yes, I would agree with that. Um, I think in order to have spiritual intelligence, um, you have to have emotional intelligence as well. It would be very difficult to conceive of somebody having spiritual intelligence. For me, from my point of view anyway, I, I would find it hard to imagine somebody having spiritual intelligence if they, if they don't have emotional intelligence as well. And um, things like uh, emotions hijacking a person uh, can really get in the way of their spiritual intelligence. So um, they are, yes, they are separate areas, um, but emotional intelligence or lack of it could really sabotage spiritual intelligence, I think. So it's something they, they need to focus on um, in order to support spiritual intelligence. Okay, correct. Um, the supplementary question which Tasneem had, uh, which you had uh, requested earlier, she, uh, in fact, I think, um, she said, but I would like to know if it is impersonal experience, email, text, and messages. I think it's a continuation of Okay. That. Yeah, email, text, and messages. So, in other words, you've just got the words, you don't have any kind of body language or voice tone to give you context uh, in which to interpret the meaning of the words. 
So, um, as we... Oops. I lost this voice. So the way that you say something obviously has a, a um, huge effect on the Sorry, uh, the sorry, Andy, I something. think we lost you for a few couple of seconds. If you oh, no, to... okay. So that, that's now. a shame. I was doing a little performance no. there of, no, no. Um, <laughs> of uh, saying something in a sarcastic tone, which meant exactly the opposite. Oh, well, you uh, might okay, have to well, repeat you, it. You, you, you're a, Oh, I, I don't need to. You, everyone's aware of how that works, so. okay. <laughs> especially the person with the uh, sarcastic manager. Um, so, yeah. In email, in text, um, in, in um, messaging, those markers, those context markers are completely absent. So sometimes you don't know what the person means because the, the words on the screen could be taken several different ways. Now here's the thing, we have a um, almost like a default position to assume the worst of uh, an email message or a text message or uh, a messaging service or, or a Facebook message where there's no context for it. Um, I myself yesterday got uh, quite annoyed about a tweet from another emotional intelligence consultant um, which was addressed to me uh, where they were talking about, um, I, I, I posted something about lack of emotional intelligence in uh, somebody's business and how it was damaging their business. and. Uh, and uh, this person said back something like, um, uh, yeah, so emotional intelligence, uh, lack of emotional intelligence can really damage your business. So I, I guess that was true in your case. And I thought, what? They're saying I've got no emotional intelligence and it's damaged my business. I got really annoyed and I, I tweeted back, excuse me? And uh, later on it transpired that actually what all they were doing was agreeing with my original, uh, my original posting. Uh, and, and it was perfectly innocently meant, but I'd automatically assume the worst, which is what tends to happen with um, just bare text communications. So anything that has an emotional content, an emotional impact, or is important, I would say please, if you can, if there's any way at all that you can see the person face to face or teleconference them or even speak to them on the phone, so at least you've got the voice tone, tone to work with. Please, um, please do that rather than email. Um, otherwise, if it's the another person sending emails to you and they're kind of hiding behind the emails, they're saying they haven't got time to speak to you or whatever, you have to craft a very careful reply that uh, will work however they meant those words. Uh, the key thing is not to assume the worst of the email straight away. Um, Robert Cooper, who um, along with uh, Ayman Sawaf wrote the book uh, Executive EQ, suggests that, uh, jokingly suggests that you electrify the send button so that you don't just fire off a reply. Uh, you think very carefully before you, you respond to an email that uh, seemingly has uh, some upsetting emotional content or some annoying emotional content because very often it's possible to take it the wrong way. So proceed with caution is about all I can say there with that one. Well, uh, that is, um, we're nearing the end of the time, but um, uh, Andy, would you like to uh, take some of the questions which were sent to you in advance and try to answer those as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. There, there were, um, there are Actually, only a couple uh, that that I've got. Oh, well, there was one. Um, can we have the um, can we have the uh, print of the webinar afterwards or the? Um, yeah, I mean that is a regular question. Are, yeah, we we, sh we will be sharing the soft copy and the recorded versions links with all of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's uh, so you will get that. Yeah. Um, right from. Uh, Imran Amjad, uh, he has sent in the question, um, um, is, um, 
is or I guess can a leader use emotions to achieve business goals, how to develop a team and help them to become a creative unit, how to um, increase the productivity of people in organizations. Um, I think, I'm hoping that the, uh, the information that we had in the webinar answers that um, yes, leaders uh, can use emotions to achieve business goals, particularly if you're aware of what motivates your people and what motivates your colleagues, you can appeal to those values. Uh, you can use your own emotional expressiveness to influence the emotions of people in your team. Um, a positive emotional climate will uh, help your team to become a creative unit and help them to work together effectively better, particularly if there's a new team coming together. And um, just to uh, send you off in a whole new direction, I would encourage you to have a look at appreciative inquiry as a method of bringing a team together and uh, as a format for helping a team to solve uh, any particular problems or improve their performance. So um, I think we've kind of answered that one in the webinar. Uh, another question. Uh, yeah, this is from um, this is from Joe Simpson. Um, yeah, so how to uh, how to coach a CEO who needs to grow their emotional intelligence but refuses to do so. Uh, this is quite a, uh, a tricky one. Um, we can have uh, uh, situations in a company, for example, where people bring in a coaching culture, uh, uh, but the CEO wants coaching for everyone except himself. You can't coach somebody who doesn't want to be coached. The first thing they need to do is to recognize that there is a problem that needs improvement. Um, so you could maybe, for example, get them to uh, take some sort of 360 survey so that uh, they recognize they're presented with evidence that uh, there's a need for them to improve their emotional intelligence. Uh, you could convince them perhaps that emotional intelligence is a useful thing to develop and leads to performance improvements. Um, find out what their values are. Find out what their values are uh, and appeal to those values. What motivates them? And link uh, the need for coaching or the need for emotional intelligence to those values. And maybe they'll come around to it. The, I'm guessing that the decision would need to feel as if it comes from them. Um, I would have a look at an essay online by Shelley Rose Chave, uh, which is called Presenting Ideas to Skeptical People, and there's another one called, I think, The Macho Test as well, where she suggests that if you have somebody who already thinks they know everything, and they don't have any problems, but any, everyone else does, uh, you have to phrase what you're saying to them very carefully so that you're not implying that they have a problem or that you're telling them something that they don't know. So anytime you're telling them something you don't, that they don't know, um, say to them something like, uh, as you know, or as you already know, and then tell them whatever it is that, uh, that uh, they don't know, in fact. Um, say to them things like, uh, well, only you can decide if this is the right way to go. Uh, work out if they're motivated more by choices and options and uh, things they can move towards, or more by avoiding problems and things they want to get away from and uh, pitch your uh, argument accordingly. So um, if they're more away from motivated, talk about uh, the downsides, the consequences of not improving emotional intelligence, for example. If they're more motivated towards, you can talk to them about uh, the possibilities and the extra things it will enable them to do, the better results it will enable them to get uh, when they start exercising unimproved emotional intelligence. Um, each case is different. Uh, another thing you can do is find out who they listen to, who influences them, and convince those people so that you're working on them indirectly rather than trying to convince the CEO yourself. So those are just some ideas, um, and uh, good luck with that, I should say. Uh.
So I need... Those are all the questions that were okay. sent in advance, I believe. Yeah. Uh, just one last question as we're running out of time. Um, could you please um, uh, share the name of the author for the book which mentioned uh, words that change minds? Yeah. Um, if I if I type this in the answer box, will it come up? Uh, you can type it to me. I think then I can broadcast to everyone. Okay. So if I type, I, actually, I think the uh, the question box is the one that's open. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I say that I'm typing away, nothing's happening. So uh, well, maybe we can email it later. I mean, I can uh, put up the knowledge. Yeah, back. sure. I'm, I will. I will email it to you uh, to you, Ali, straight after the uh, the webinar closes. And, okay. Um, but maybe we can announce it yep, here the name I'll of the that. author, and we can then type it later in the email. Yep. So who's the author? Yep, and okay. Uh, yeah. The the author is Shelley Rose Charvet, which I shall spell. It's S H E L L E uh, Rose R O S E and then Chave is C H A R V E T and the book is called Words That Change Minds. Yeah. It's it's a great book. It's highly recommended. Um, the other books I mentioned are of course Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. Uh, which I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of already, and another good book uh, which is called Executive EQ, capital E, capital Q, by Robert Cooper and Ayman Sawaf. I hope I'm present, uh, pronouncing that correctly. It's A Y M A N S A W A F. Ayman, yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, as Andy, we discussed, uh, would be nice if you could email it to me and then I'll stream it to everyone. Meanwhile, we can take just one sure. last question from Rantarik, uh, who's asked, does musical include voice change? How can musical voice change affect emotional climate? I think in one of the slides you mentioned about the music. Uh, yes, musical, musical intelligence, which I, I mentioned in passing, really, as being one of the m multiple intelligences that um, Howard Gardner mentioned. Um, However, voice tone uh, does have a bearing on emotional intelligence because um, it's it's a clue to how somebody's feeling. Uh, you know, if somebody gets upset, for example, their breathing tends to get interrupted, and and you can hear that in their voice. Um, you can get some idea of what's important to people by the emphasis that they place on particular words or phrases. So if somebody says, uh, you know, this decision by the, uh, by the senior management, it's just not fair, then you can pretty much tell that fairness is an important value to them. Uh, you can, yeah, you can, you can convey emotion in your own voice. Uh, again, this is slightly culturally determined because um, some cultures have uh, have ranges of kind of uh, acceptable voice tones or, or voice tones that you'd use in polite conversation, uh, which may be different to other cultures. But um, yeah, if you're sounding interested and engaged in your voice, uh, generally perhaps your voice will be slightly quicker. Um, in communication with particular individual people, if it's just one-to-one, -one, generally you want to be talking to them at about the same kind of speed and volume and voice tone that they're talking to you in. So, you know, if they're a kind of quite slow talking and quiet person, you probably don't want to be talking to them really fast and really loud and, and uh, really energetically like that because um, they will they will have trouble relating to that. So so matching voice tones is quite a good idea as well. Okay. Uh, that uh, goes some way to answering that question. Well, yeah, I guess. Um, well, Andy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I uh, would like to thank mm -hmm. you, uh, especially on behalf of Maud, for your time and your willingness to share this valuable information and your experiences with our participants. Uh, folks, just to let you know that Andy will be coming to Amal Medina uh, in the month of April for 
our uh, leadership program for uh, advanced management, uh, uh, which is called PAM. It's the fifth version, PAM 5, it's to be held in uh, April. You can get more details from our website, www.mile.org, uh, for all the upcoming webinars and programs. And once again, Andy, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you who participated. We are glad to join us today, and I hope this session was uh, helpful to, to all of you. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, everyone. I yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I am honored. Thank you very much. We are. So I'm going to be closing this webinar, and uh, 